Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and today's show is going to be a little bit different from previous shows because today we're featuring not just one saint, but two. That's right, today you get two saints for the price of one because these two saints suffered together for the Christian faith. And so because their lives were intertwined in their suffering and in their death, in the life of the church, they are often celebrated together. So that's what we're going to do in the show today. Now, who am I talking about? I'm talking about Saint Perpetua and Saint Felicity. These two women were a part of the early church. They lived only about 200 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the church is still very young at this point in history. Perpetua and Felicity were from the city of Carthage, which is in northern Africa in modern-day Tunisia. And Carthage was a part of the larger Roman Empire at this point. In order for us to understand what happened in the life of Perpetua and Felicity, we need to look a little bit into the backstory, into the history of the Roman Empire's relationship with Christianity. When Christianity was first founded, it was seen as just an offshoot of Judaism, wasn't seen as that threatening. But as more and more pagan Romans began to convert to Christianity, the emperor began to view Christians as a threat. And he viewed them as a threat because Christians refused to worship the emperor as a god, as he was used to being worshipped as a god, the Christians refused to do this. They only held their belief in one god. They also refused to worship all of the pagan gods that had become a part of the culture. And so this was seen as an act of treason, as an act of disloyalty to the emperor. And so throughout Roman history, at many different points, Christians faced persecution, either by local mobs or by local governors, or even sometimes by an imperial edict where the emperor would make it illegal for any Christian to practice their faith in his empire. Now, at the time of Perpetua and Felicity, such an order had been given. The emperor had forbidden anyone from converting to Christianity on pain of death. And one of the ways that they would test people to make sure that they were not Christian was to bring everyone to a great pagan feast. And they would ask them all to sacrifice to pagan idols. They would give everyone uh, a small amount of incense to throw into a fire before their pagan gods. And the Christians would refuse to do this. They would refuse to participate in idolatry. They would refuse to worship other idols. And so they wouldn't throw the incense into the fire, into the sacrificial fire. And then they would be arrested and put to death for being a Christian. And it was during one of these persecutions that Perpetua and Felicity were arrested. Now, we don't know too much about the early life of either of these two women. We know that Felicity was a slave woman. She was a slave. There was a lot of slaves in the Roman Empire at this time. And she was also heavily pregnant at the time of her arrest. She was very far along in her pregnancy, and she had not been baptized yet. She believed in Jesus, and she was a catechumen, which meant that she was being uh, prepared for baptism, but Felicity was not yet baptized. We know a little bit more about Perpetua, because Perpetua kept a diary, which is what we uh, learn most about these two women from this diary, and so we know a little bit more about Perpetua. Perpetua was a noblewoman and she was about 22 years old when she was arrested. Her family was uh, of mixed religion. Her father was still a pagan. He worshiped the old gods of Rome, but her mother and her brother were both Christians. Now, Perpetua and her brother were not baptized yet. They too were catechumens training for baptism, and Perpetua had actually had a younger brother named Dinocratus, who had died much earlier at the age of seven from uh, an aggressive cancer in his face. And we, again, we know all of this from Perpetua's diary that we still have today. Now, when Perpetua and Felicity were arrested, but before they were taken to the main prison, Perpetua's father 
came to plead with her. He came to his daughter, pleading with her to abandon her Christian faith and come back to live with him in safety. And in response to this, Perpetua pointed to a water pot nearby and she said, Father, can you see this water pot? Can it be called anything else than a water pot? And he said, no, of course not. It's, it's a water pot. That's what it is. And she said, in the same way, I too cannot be called anything other than what I am. And I am a Christian. Now, this response in the face of his pleas and the face of his tears enraged her father, and he finally left her alone. Now, soon after this episode, all of the Christians, Perpetua and Felicity and a group of other Christians that had been arrested, who had refused to worship the gods of Rome, they were all put in prison. And Perpetua, at this point, had still a nursing baby to take care of. She had just delivered, she was married, she had a nursing baby to take care of, and she writes in her journal her experience of going to prison for her faith. She writes, I was terrified. I had never before been in such a dark hole. What a difficult time it was. With all the crowd, the heat was stifling. And then there was the extortion of the soldiers, and to crown it all, I was tortured with worry for my baby there. So she's painting this picture of what it was like for these Christians. They were shoved into this overcrowded, stifling, hot prison where the soldiers were mocking them, mistreating them, beating them, and she's trying to protect her baby who she's still trying to nurse. We can imagine the anxiety that she's going through, not to mention the anxiety that Felicity is going through being heavily pregnant at this point in prison. Now, Perpetua's friends were able to bribe the guards to allow them to go from the holding cell that they were originally in to a better part of the prison, where she was thankfully able to nurse her baby and bring her baby back to health because the baby was quite sick at this point. And she was eventually able to smuggle the baby out of prison to the care of her family, who was still on the outside. But while she's in prison, Perpetua begins to have visions. And her first vision that she has is of this great ladder that reaches all the way to heaven. But in order to climb the ladder, there is a dragon in the way that she has to step on in order to ascend the ladder. And she takes this as she is soon going to be ascending to heaven. But in order to do that, she has to conquer the dragon, a simple for uh, the devil, through her martyrdom. She also saw a vision of her brother who had died earlier, Dinocratus. And at first she saw him in the vision. He was dirty. His face still bore the marks of the cancer disease that had taken his life. And he was trying to drink water from a basin, but the basin was too high for him to reach. And so he was thirsty. He was dirty. He was not having a good time in the afterlife. She saw that he was suffering there. And so she offered up her suffering and her prayers as she was there in prison for his soul. And later on, she receives a vision where he is seen clothed in white. His face has been healed and he's able to drink out of the water basin that he had been trying to reach and also playing with other white robed children in a heavenly place. Now, this vision that Perpetua had has helped to develop our Catholic understanding of purgatory. And if you haven't heard too much about purgatory, Catholic teaching teaches that there is a place where souls who are saved but not yet ready for heaven because they still have some residual sin on their soul, they go to purgatory to be purified. So in Revelation uh, chapter 21 verse 7, it says, nothing unclean shall enter into heaven. And so what God in his mercy does is he provides a place for souls of the saved to go for a final purification before they enter into the glory of heaven. So if a soul dies and is on his way to heaven, but still has some stain of sin on him, he goes into purgatory in order to be purged of that so that he can enter into heaven perfectly clean. Now, purgatory is not a pleasant place to be because this purification is painful. 
But the pain is not a hopeless pain because the souls who are in purgatory, the men and the women who are in purgatory, look forward eagerly to heaven. They are assured of salvation. They're just in the final cleanup stage before they go there. The souls in purgatory are our fellow brothers and sisters in faith, and we can pray for them that they can be speedily released into heaven to be with God forever. And this is what Perpetua was doing for her brother's soul. The first vision she saw was probably her brother in purgatory, suffering, unable to see God face to face. But after her prayers, after her penance for him, his soul was released from purgatory and he was able to enter into heaven, which is a great lesson for all of us. If we want to become saints, if we want to grow in holiness, we can pray for our brothers and sisters who have gone on before us, those who have died. We can pray for their souls so that they can be speedily released from purgatory to enter into the joy of heaven. Now, the Christians who were in prison at this time with Perpetua and Felicity, all of them were summoned together to go to court. And that was where their hearing would be. That was where they would finally be asked, are you a Christian? And if they would deny their faith, they were able to leave and go free. But if they were going to stay steadfast to Christ, that was where they would be sentenced. And while they were in court, they were commanded to offer pagan sacrifices to show, to prove that they had apostatized from their faith, that they had left Jesus behind. Now, right before Perpetua was brought to trial, her father actually came into the courtroom carrying her child. He was trying this one last emotional plea to get Perpetua to leave her Christian faith behind and to return to paganism with him. And in the court documents from that time, we read what her father said. He said, have pity on my gray head. Have pity on me, your father, if I even deserve to be called your father. Think of your brothers. Think of your mother and your aunt. Think of your child who will not be able to live once you are gone. Give up your pride. You will destroy all of us. And even the governor who is hearing the trial is moved by her father's plea. And he turns to Perpetua and says, have pity on your father's gray head. Have pity on your infant son. Offer the sacrifice for the welfare of the emperors. What an emotional appeal. We can only imagine the stress that this put on Perpetua to recant her faith, to leave Jesus behind as her family is pleading with her to leave Jesus and save her life. But she would not do it. She remained steadfast. She told the court that she would not sacrifice to idols, that she was a Christian, and that she worshipped the one true God alone. And so as a result, Perpetua, Felicity, and all the other Christians who were in the prison were condemned to death. And they were condemned to death in a particularly violent and cruel way. You see, in the Roman Empire at this time, one of the ways that the crowd would be entertained, one of their methods of entertainment was to go to the arena. And in the arena, political prisoners, uh, criminals would be brought into the arena and fed to wild animals. And this bloody spectacle would be watched and cheered almost like it was a sporting event. And so all of the Christians were condemned to death by beasts in the arena. But unafraid of this, Perpetua and Felicity agreed to their sentencing and they went to prison, awaiting the day where they would be fed to wild animals. Now, before Perpetua was sent to the arena, she had another vision. She dreamed that as she was going into the arena, instead of facing animals, she came face to face with a wrestler. And in her vision, she wrestles this opponent, she beats him, and she crushes his head. And then her trainer comes to her in the vision and gives her a branch of victory, which was a symbol of her winning the contest, saying, peace be with you, my daughter. And then she began to walk in triumph toward the gate of life before she woke up. And she understood this as a symbol of what would happen to her in the arena, that she was not going to face animals, 
but that the devil would try in those last moments to tempt her to despair, but that her victory would be over the enemy symbolized by the wrestler when she went into that arena to face her martyrdom. She said in her journal, I realized that it was not with wild animals that I would fight, but with the devil. But I knew that I would win the victory. Meanwhile, back in prison, Felicity is still eight months pregnant, and she is worried that she won't be able to die with the others, but that her execution will be delayed. According to Roman law at the time, it was illegal to execute a pregnant woman because it was seen as unfair to the unborn baby that she was carrying. And so Felicity is worried that she will be left by herself in the prison for an extra month while the others are martyred without her. And so all of them together prayed that she would deliver the baby early. And just as they're praying is when she starts to experience the contraction pains. And so she has a very early delivery in the prison. The delivery is very painful. Uh, it's a very stressful delivery for her, not just because she is in prison, but also because it's an early delivery. And while she is struggling with the pains of labor, the guards of the prison came to her cell and mocked her. And this is what they said. We read from Perpetua's journal. They told Felicity, you're suffering so much right now, but what will you do when you are tossed to the beasts? Little did you think of them when you refused to sacrifice. They're mocking her saying, you think you're in pain now from labor? Imagine what it's like to be thrown to the animals when we're going to watch you be tortured in the arena for being a Christian. But Felicity lovingly responded to them, what I am suffering now I'm suffering by myself. But then, when she's talking about going to the arena, then another will be inside of me who will suffer for me, just as I shall be suffering for him. Felicity is so full of faith. She says, when I'm in the arena, yes, I'm going to be suffering for Jesus, but Jesus, his strength is going to be in me, giving me the strength that I need to face those animals and the pain that will come from my death in the arena. In the days leading up to their execution, pagan onlookers, Roman onlookers, would come to mock the Christians while they were in prison. But the Christians would evangelize them. They would preach to them. They would tell them to convert from their pagan idolatry. And many of them were so impressed by these Christians' courage in the face of such a horrible death that they too converted to Christianity. And so they were still making converts even while in prison. On the day of their execution, Perpetua and Felicity marched out joyfully. They gazed fearlessly at the mob who had gathered to call for their blood. The people were excited to see this show of Christians being killed by wild animals, and yet they came out unafraid. The Christians in the group were fed or, or matched with different animals, some with bears, some with leopards, some were tied to beasts to be dragged or trampled. But when it came time for Felicity and Perpetua to be brought out into the arena, they were matched with a mad, wild heifer. And so the women were brought into the arena. Originally, they were brought out naked, dressed only in nets as a final way to shame them. But the crowd in the arena was so shocked by the indecency of the executioners for bringing out these new mothers in such a state that they booed and they called for the women to be at least clothed before they came into the arena. And so Perpetua and Felicity were brought out, the nets were taken off of them, and they were clothed in regular tunics and brought out. Then we read from the account of those who watched what happened to Perpetua and Felicity firsthand. It says, the heifer tossed Perpetua and she fell on her back. Then sitting up, she pulled down the tunic that was ripped along the side so that it covered her thighs, thinking more of her modesty than of her pain. Next, she asked for a pin to fasten her untidy hair, for she said it was not right that a martyr should die with her hair in disorder, lest she might be seen to be mourning in her hour of triumph. Then Perpetua got up, and seeing that Felicity had been crushed to the ground, she went over to her, gave her her hand, and lifted her up. And then the two women stood side by side. 
So Perpetua and Felicity are faced with this mad charging heifer that charges the women. It tosses Perpetua in the air. It tramples Felicity into the ground. But after the attack, the women were brought out of the arena back into the holding cell and Perpetua was in a daze. She was probably in shock. She kept asking her fellow prisoners when they were going to be put into the arena. She didn't have a memory of going out there. It was only after they showed her the wounds from where the heifer had gored her with its horns that she was convinced that she had actually been in the arena. Eventually all the Christians who the animals hadn't killed but had only wounded were brought out again into the arena to be finished off by gladiators who would kill them with a sword. Now Felicity had already died at this point. Remember, she had been crushed to the ground by the trampling heifer. But it was Perpetua that was brought out into the arena to be killed by the sword. And when it was her turn, the first stroke of the sword didn't kill her right away. And we read from those who watched her die, it said she screamed as she was struck on the bone, probably the bone in her neck or on her shoulder blade. But she took with a trembling hand, the hand of the young gladiator and guided it to her throat. So she had to guide the soldier who was put there to kill her, guide the sword to her own throat so that he wouldn't miss again. And eventually she was killed and gained the crown of martyrdom. Perpetua and Felicity, they died a horrible death. They were trampled and gored by a wild heifer before being put out of their misery with a sword. And they did all of this because they refused to deny Jesus. They refused to worship false gods. They gave their lives for the sake of their faith. So what can we learn from them? In order to become saints ourselves, we're not faced with people who will throw us to wild animals for denying Jesus. So what can we learn from Perpetua and Felicity? Well, I think a major lesson we can learn is that in order to be a saint like they were, we need to be willing to give up everything for Jesus, just like they were. We need to get our priorities in order. You know, Perpetua and Felicity, they didn't want to die this way. They just wanted to live a normal life. They had their own families, their own children. They loved to be alive. They didn't want this, but they were willing to give it up for the sake of Jesus. And we need to be ready for that as well. I'm not saying that normal life, our jobs, our families, being alive are, are bad things. Of course, these are good things, but all of them need to be in proper order. They come second place to Jesus, our family, our job, our health, all of it comes second to Jesus. Because only when we surrender our lives to Jesus can we truly receive the good from all of these other secondary things. If we put these things before God, if we put our family before God, if we put our children before God, if we put our, our health, our life, our pleasure before God, that twists our priorities. And when that twisting happens, we try and seek fulfillment in things rather than in God. And our hearts can only be satisfied in God, not in any of these other things. Only when we put our trust in God first and have him as our first priority, are we able to enjoy all the other blessings that he's given us in our family and in our life. So let's pray for that grace today so that we can become saints like St. Perpetua and St. Felicity were. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, Lord, through the intercession of St. Perpetua and St. Felicity, who were both new mothers when they earned the crown of martyrdom, we pray for all pregnant mothers, all new mothers, and their children. We ask, Lord, that like St. Perpetua and Felicity, we would be given a boldness to live for you in the face of any persecution we receive, either from our society or even from our own families. Help us to keep our priorities straight so that we would never lose our focus on you as the main thing from whom all the other blessings in our life come from. St. Perpetua and St. Felicity, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.